morning, San Inez Valley Presbyterian Church. Bless you. Uh, today, Glenn will be preaching about the resurrection from Matthew, and we're told that every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Lord Jesus. I want to encourage you to wear your masks today, if you would please, and stand as we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. To the hillside where justice and mercy embrace, there the Son of God gave his life for us, and the measureless debt was erased. Jesus, Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, a Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Amen. Turn your eyes to the Lord. Christ the Lion away. What a glorious dawn, fear of death is gone. For we carry his life in our way. Jesus, Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heaven. Turn your eyes to the heavens, our King will return for his own. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout, all glory to Jesus alone. Jesus. You we lift our eyes, Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior and our true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. We could ask Joe to come on up. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Today's scripture reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Starting with. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? 
Or have you forgotten that when we were joined to Christ, Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And Jesus as Christ, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also made live new lives. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. God is good. All the time. All the time. All right. So now please stand and join us as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross into because he lives as we celebrate his resurrection today. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love for me. Across the river, I 
Let's bow our heads, shall we? At this time, we want to just have our hearts be open to the Lord. As we come to confess our sins, we recognize the fact that without God's mercy, we have no place in His presence. Without His amazing grace of what He's accomplished on the cross for us, we have no business being in His presence, and yet He calls us to come, to lay down our burdens at the cross, to lay our sins at his feet so that we might be forgiven, so that our relationship with him would be restored and renewed. Many times there are sins in our life that we hold on to and that we don't want to give up, and they burden us from the inside. Lord, may this morning our hearts be filled with your joy and with your forgiveness. Psalm 32 reminds us of this this very thing. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, Lord, I confess my transgressions, and you forgave me. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the fact that you forgive us. We thank you, Lord, the fact that you have called us to come, to be in your presence this morning with pure hearts, clean hearts, hearts that are ready to receive from you your word, hearts that are ready not only to receive your word, but to go from this place transformed and renewed in our relationship with you and our relationship with each other. So bless us now, Lord, as we come and continue to worship to continue to hear from you and to acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. His mercy is more. Please stand. What love could remember no wrongs we have Mission or knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. I soon say, Amen. His mercy is more. With patience we wait as we constantly roam With fathers so tender, is calling us home He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor My sins there are many, His mercy is more Praise the Lord, praise the Lord 
praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger the darkness, new every morn. My sins they are many. His mercy is more. My sins they are many. His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord His mercy is more, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done, all mission, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. It's stronger than darkness. New every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Please be seated. Amen. Bless you today. Thank you, Amelie. It's great to have both the Loya girls here to play a little J.S. Bach. We were realizing this stuff was written probably 300 years ago in 1720. Wonderful to see your confidence and musicality develop. We'd like to invite the children to go with Miss Liz right now, and you can stand and greet one another. Why don't you do that? With the masks on. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Did you see me fight with my mask? <laughs> I was trying to get the mask off so I could do the confessions and it got caught on my ear thing and I'm like fighting with it. Oh well, we got to do what we got to do, right? <laughs> well, it is, it is a good day to come and worship the Lord regardless of whether we have to wear masks or not. Um, we're just thankful to be able to be in His presence and to meet together as brothers and sisters. 
As you know, we are almost done with the book of Matthew. And it's been a long time. We've been at it for over a year. And it's, um, it's been an amazing, amazing study. But we get to the good part today. And um, we've, we've experienced a lot, of, a lot of ups and downs in the book of Matthew. We've experienced a lot of heartaches, a lot of miracles, a lot of really good things that Jesus has done. But he's all, we've also, over the last week, of the Holy Week, we've experienced a lot of heartache and pain that Jesus has gone through and his disciples have gone through. But it pays off. It's going to make a big difference in their lives, but it makes a big difference in our lives as well. And as we begin to conclude this study, uh, we're going to be here one more week next week. We'll conclude the book of Matthew next week. And then I'm going to um, do one sermon on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And then a week after that, Joel will be preaching. And then the week after that, we will be beginning the book of James. So that's kind of what's coming up ahead, just to let you kind of know where, where we're headed. And we'll spend a, a good amount of time in the book of James. There's a lot to be, to be gleaned from that book. And it actually really goes along well with what we've been studying in the book of Matthew, because James draws a lot of his material and a lot of his influence comes from that Jewish-oriented book of Matthew, and James was a big part of that as well. But last week we saw how Joseph of Arimathea uh, takes Jesus from the cross because Jesus' family couldn't afford it, and they didn't have a, a tomb in Jerusalem for them to bury Jesus, and so it was kind of in a dilemma, and Joseph of Arimathea steps up, takes the body, gets his friend Nicodemus, who is also on the council, uh, two guys that were in leadership positions in the Jewish of leadership, but were, were quiet partners of, with Jesus, quiet followers of Jesus, and they come out, and they begin to be publicly um, aware of what, who they are following and, and make their following public to those around them as well. And they come and get the body, and they put it in Joseph's own grave, and as they put him in the grave, um, the scribes and the Pharisees go and they want the, zoom, the, uh, the tomb sealed as well. So they go to Pilate and get Pilate to get a, a guard, a number of guards to go there, Roman guards to go to the grave and to protect the grave, thinking that the disciples might come and want to steal the body. But we realized last week that that was a futile feat. They could not do it. We saw last week that nothing in all of creation would ever hold Jesus in the grave. This is the most amazing, exciting, wonderful good news in all of creation from eternity to eternity. It is the center point of God's redemptive plan for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. It is the kingpin for who we are as Christians. It is what we base our total relationship with Christ on. And today we see how that begins and we look forward to the fact that this is something that is so unique and so powerful, and we have the privilege of being able to be the beneficiaries of this this morning. We're going to turn in our Bibles to Roman, I mean to Matthew 28, uh, verses 1 through 15. I'll be reading from there, and there'll be words on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. Let's read together. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look in the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, they clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. 
And while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests and met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will sat satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. May God add his blessing to his reading of his word, and let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come with joyful hearts this morning, with celebration on our hearts and celebration on our lips, because of what this day represents. The day that you rose from the dead, the day that you defeated sin and death and gave us victory, and that we might have eternal life. And so this morning, Lord, we ask that you would again enlighten our hearts and our minds, transform us from the inside out to be better followers of you, more joyful followers, more obedient followers, because of the great things that you have done. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was the first day of the week, which make it a Sunday. And Jesus had been in the grave for three days. And you say, well, how can Friday to Sunday be three days? But in the Jewish way of counting time, any time of day meant that it was a full day. So that means Friday was one day, Saturday was one day, and Sunday was one day. And having been in the grave for three days, the Jews' religious leaders go on the Sabbath day, defiling the Sabbath, and they go to Pilate and ask Pilate um, to guard the temple, to guard the tomb. And so Pilate gives them the, the, uh, the authority to go guard the tomb. In the meantime, the Marys are preparing spices to anoint Jesus at the burial site at the tomb. And at the break of day, they go with their spices to the tomb. And it's interesting to realize that what are they looking for? Jesus has been telling them that he would rise from the dead. Over and over again, at least three times, Jesus reminds his disciples and those who were following that he would rise from the dead. But as the women get to the grave, they are not looking for the resurrected Christ. They are looking for a, a body to anoint. But as they get there, something amazing and miraculous takes place. They come to the garden grave, and as they come, there's a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord has come, and he rolls back the stone, opening the grave. And I find this kind of amusing, actually, that he goes and sits on the, on the tombstone. He sits on the big stone, and I find it kind of amusing because it seems too casual for an angel of the Lord to kind of just sit there on the grave like, hey, how's it going? Come check it out. You know, it reminded me, reminded me of when uh, Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden and God put an angel with a fiery sword so they couldn't get back, that this angel stood guard. As we see angels, we see them as majestic. We see them as holy and righteous and very much uh, in power. And those who were there, the soldiers who were there, understood this because they shook like an earthquake and they fell down to the ground as if they were dead. But the angel of the Lord reminds us that we are not to fear. Fear not, he says to the women at the tomb. Even during the violent earthquake, even during the fact that this angel is like lightning, his clothes are white as snow, the brilliance of this creature, the brilliance of this angel was out of this world. He wasn't an alien, but he was an, alien, he was an agent of the Almighty God to come and bring good news. And it reminded me of, at the beginning of the book of Matthew, how the angel of the Lord comes to Mary and tells her the good news that she will be the mother of the Messiah. The angel announcing the miraculous conception. And now the angel comes and announces the miraculous resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It acts as a bookend for the book of Matthew, beginning with the miracle of the incarnation and ending in the miracle of the resurrection. The angel's appearance to these soldiers was the most fearful thing that they could experience. They fell to the ground as if they were dead. 
You see, when we encounter the holiness and righteousness of a, of a holy creature, it does something to us. It causes us to tremble. It causes us to shake in fear. It causes us to be dead-like. Why? Because we recognize the fact that we are not like that being. We are not holy and pure and righteous. The brilliance of this angel representing the brilliance and holiness of God is a threat to us because we recognize how sinful we are. The soldiers fell down as if they were dead. Is it kind of an ironic thing to me? Because we realize that Jesus, who was dead, rises from the dead. The soldiers who were alive fall down as if they were dead. Why the dramatics? Why did the earthquake quake? Why did the angel come? The earthquake, you remember when Jesus died on the cross, there was a great earthquake. Remember we talked about last week that when Moses received the Ten Commandments, the earth shook. We realize that also in the book of Revelation, the earth will shake at the seventh bowl of God's judgment. It will be the greatest earthquake that will ever have happened on planet earth. You see, when the earth quakes, it's a representative that God is at work. It's a representation that even nature understands that there is a holy God and this holy God is at work. The earth quakes because Jesus is resurrected from the, from the grave. When the earth quaked at his crucifixion, it was as if the earth quaked in sorrow. But now when the earth quakes this time, it is as if the, if, as if the earth quakes in joyful, exuberant exaltation. You see, even nature represents the fact that God is alive, that God is personal to his creation. Then we have to ask the question about the resurrection. We're not to be afraid, but is it possible? Dead people don't rise. Is it possible that Jesus really did rise from the dead? Every other religion in the world has a dead leader. We can go to their grave. We understand that they might have been good teachers. They might have had some important things to say. But Jesus is different. Jesus' grave is empty. And Jesus' grave will always be empty. You see, Jesus is different. His word is different. His actions are different. He fulfilled his own prediction. He's not here. He has risen as he said, the angel said. He has defeated sin and death triumphantly. I've been watching the highlights of the Olympic Games, and you notice that our uh, BBS had an Olympic theme to it, and that's why we left the, the Olympic things up there for you to see. And it was a great week of BBS, and it was wonderful to see all the kids and all the helpers and leaders. And by the way, I just want to thank all those that were involved. Um, it was a great opportunity to be a witness to our community, and it was well done, and we just really appreciate and give God the glory and thanks for all those that helped, so thank you so much. But as I was watching the highlights of the Olympics and watching these people win gold medals and watching these people win races and how they would celebrate, uh, they would be, have tears in their eyes of joy, they would fall on the ground in, in exaltation, they, they had spent it all, they had given everything that they had, all their training and hard work had finally paid off, and they win their races, and they are ecstatically, they are ecstatic in their celebration. Then I think about Jesus. Jesus rises from the dead. Where's the celebration? Where are the disciples? Hey, let's wait for Jesus at the tomb to see when he rises from the dead. That didn't happen. You see, Jesus is the most unassuming Savior that could ever be. Only God would think up something like this. Only God would think up this kind of way to, be, to re reveal the Savior of the world, so unassuming and yet so miraculous. There's no celebration. There's no fanfare. There's just the empty grave. Soldiers lying down as if dead, and women just confused about what's going on. And Jesus comes to the women and he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Are you fearful today? 
There's a lot of weirdness going on in our world today, a lot of uncertainty. People are acting out with a lot of fear, fear of the future, this virus raising its head again. How long are we going to have to do what we're going to do? How is this going to affect our businesses? How is this going to affect our government? How is this going to affect our world relationships with other countries? We live in a world full of fear. And yet Jesus even today says, do not be afraid. Why? Why does he give us that word? Why did the angel give, Mary's, give the Marys that word? Because there's something greater than the things that are going on in the world. There's something more powerful. There's something more exalted than what's going on in the world. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my work will never pass away. See, the greatest thing that ever took place is the resurrection. It is the most powerful event of all of history. And Jesus said, because that event takes place, you do not need to be afraid. Don't be afraid, he's risen, the angel said. Come and see. Come and believe. Do not be afraid. Isn't that what the angel told the, told the shepherds in the field, keeping their flock, watched over their flock by night as Jesus was being born? Do not be afraid. Isn't that what the angel told Joseph as he told Joseph that he was going to be um, Mary's husband and that he would be the father, earthly father of the Savior? Isn't that what he tells his disciples when he sees them in the upper room? Do not be afraid. Isn't that what he says to them in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you might be also. You don't need to be afraid. You can know that your hand in the hand of the Savior is the strongest place you could ever have. Is it true? Is the resurrection true? Well, last week we saw the fact that, yes, Jesus really did die on the cross. Yes, they really did put him in a grave. Jesus fulfilled his prediction in verse 6 by saying he has risen from the grave. But here's an interesting tidbit. The witness of the women. In those days, women's voice was not heard very much. In fact, a woman could not even be a witness in a court of law. And yet, here is God doing the most ironic thing, having women be the first ones to come to the grave and experience the risen Christ. And what does the angel say to them? Go and tell the good news. Don't be afraid. Come and see that the Lord has risen. Isn't that what Philip did with Nathaniel? Remember in John chapter 1, Philip goes to Nathaniel. He says, you know what, Nathaniel, I think we found the Savior. I think we found the Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And what is Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth. And then what does Philip say? Come and see. Come and see. You see, that's the message we have to the world. Come and see. Come and check out Jesus. Come and check out the Word. We don't have to argue people into the faith. In fact, we'll never argue somebody into the faith. But we can invite them to check out the Savior. Come and see about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. Let me tell you how his love and his mercy and his grace can transform your life. The invitation for us to give to the world is come and see. And as the women go and see, they believe, and they are excited and thrilled to be able to go and express things to the, to the disciples. So the message is not just come and see. There's a lot of us who have come and, saw, and seen, have experienced the risen Christ, but there's maybe not a lot of us that do the next step. And what does he tell them? Go and tell. You see, the Christian life is a life of come and see, but it is also the life of go and tell. Hurry, the angel says, and tell the disciples, he is risen from the grave. The Lord Jesus himself tells them to go to his brothers 
and tell them that he has risen from the grave. I'll see you in Galilee, he says. The greatest news given to women in that culture who would not even be able to give it an account in a quarter of law. And yet God uses them to transform the world. One message given to disciples. The disciples share it with others all the way up to today. And we are beneficiaries of those women who were faithful to, present, to prepare and to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus greets them on the way as they're going. He says, greetings, shalom. And what do the women do? They fall down and worship. They grab his feet and they hold on to him and they worship him. Again, an example of what a Christian life is like. They went and saw. They went and told. But they were so involved and so in love with Christ that they bowed down and worshipped. No ego. Nothing holding them back. They didn't care what people thought. They just gave themselves over to the Lord. What an example. What an example for me, and maybe for you too, that to really be alive in Christ is to be alive in submission to his lordship, is to be alive to submission of his word, that the word of God is alive and active in each one of us, and that as he reveals himself to you, more and more it causes each one of us to worship and adore him. We stand up here and we sing praises to God, but it's not just words. It's words of obedient worship unto a living and holy God who gives us all things in him. The women were filled with joy, and they ran, and they went to go to see where the disciples were. And Jesus told them, do not be afraid. Peace I give to you, says the Lord, not as the world gives. Do not be troubled or be afraid. Do you know that peace in your life? Do you know that joy that these women experienced in their lives, experiencing the living Christ? And the peace that goes beyond understanding that even in a world that's full of confusion, even in a world that's full of hatred and bitterness, that the peace of God can rule in your life because of what Christ has done on the cross. But there's always opposition, isn't there? Always opposition. What this opposition is, is the guards go. In the meantime, as Marys, as Marys are going to the disciples, some of the guards leave the tomb area, and they go and report to the high priests what exactly took place. And I find that interesting that they go and tell them exactly what took place. So that means they went and said, well, there was a bright light. The angel sat on the, on, the, on the tombstone. A big earthquake took place. And there's no body in the grave. And the, the scribes and the Pharisees scratch their head and they say, okay, uh, what are we going to do about this one? And instead of repenting, instead of recognizing the fact that Christ has risen, they come up with all sorts of excuses and schemes. It reminds me of even today that even given the facts of Christ's resurrection, the world comes up with all kinds of excuses and schemes to deny it. They come up with the idea that, oh, well, you guys must have fallen asleep, and uh, while you were asleep, uh, the disciples came and stole the body away and didn't even wake you up. And so they give them a whole bunch of money. They say, okay. The scribes and Pharisees say, well, if this gets to the governor, uh, we'll protect you. We'll, we have an alliance, this unholy alliance that protects you and spreads the rumor that Jesus was stolen and that his body is not to be found because the disciples had come and stolen the body. Now, that's really ironic, isn't it? The whole reason why the guards were sent there was so that they would not fall asleep and protect the body. Because if the guards had fallen asleep, the, the, the penalty for that 
was very severe. It could have been even death. And so they're willing to put their lives on the line to spread this false rumor. And they tell the priests all the stories. But isn't this typical? The high priests and the Sadducees used treachery. They gave Judas 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. They had an illegal trial, a kangaroo trial that took place at night, accusing Jesus of treason and blasphemy. They used slander to charge him with, to Pilate. And now they use bribery to bribe the guards, to pay them off, to keep their mouths shut. What would it take for you to deny the Lord? Matthew 16, 26 says, What will a man gain if he gains the world and yet loses his soul? See, there is nothing in of all the universe that is worth more than the resurrected Christ. Not riches, not fame, not seven gold medals. Nothing is more precious and valuable and has eternal value. A gold medal might get passed on from one generation to another, but it won't last. The only thing that will last is Christ crucified, resurrected, ascended, interceding for you and for me. Imagine the soldiers on the street of Jerusalem. Someone comes up to him, says, weren't you one of the soldiers that guarded the tomb? Well, yeah, 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 I guess I was. Well, what happened to the body? I heard that, uh, that the disciples came while you were sleeping and uh, stole the body. Yep, that's about right. Another one comes up to him and says, you know, ask the same question. This person was a little bit more skeptical and more probing. Do you really expect me to believe that you and all the other guards, you guards that are military trained, you guards that have all this active training behind your belt, and you expect me to believe that, oh, by the way, you just fell asleep? To let some scared Galilean fisherman come and steal the body away? Uh, didn't, didn't you feel like this earthquake? Didn't that kind of wake you up? Oh, and if, if the body was stolen, how do you know if you were sleeping? Just some questions they might ask them. Well, the, here's, the, here's the thing. It, seeks, it makes a whole lot more sense, according to the evidence, that Jesus actually rose from the grave. And Jesus rose triumphantly. I want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians on how important the resurrection is. 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, and then 13 through 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says this, For what I received I passed on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. And then down in verse 13 says this, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise Christ, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is what? Is futile. You are still dead in your sins. 
How important is the resurrection to the Christian? You know, Jesus did a lot of miracles. He was unique in the way that he performed miracles. Jesus had the most amazing moral teaching more than any other religious leader in all of the universe, of all the planet, of all time. He was the kindest, most loving person that ever walked the face of the earth. All those things point to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. But the one that seals the deal, the one that is the most important, the one that is the kingpin of all is the resurrection. My question to each one of us this morning is, what are you going to do about the resurrection? All the witnesses, all the evidence point to the fact that indeed Christ rose from the dead. You see, we have a reasonable faith. Faith not based on myth. Faith based not based on uh, once upon a time fairy tale, but faith based on the unique witness of people all over in the Bible and elsewhere that re re renews their faith by knowing that their faith is strengthened by the fact that the resurrection was true and is the kingpin of our faith. How will you respond to the resurrection? What will you do with Jesus? Some acknowledge this is truth, but never turn to God in faith. Some just flat out refuse it and come up with all kinds of excuses. Some make false teachings out of this and form cults. But others, many of you, take the truth and believe. You rejoice in the fact that your salvation is secure. You have the joy that is completely out of this world because of what Christ has done for you. You are assured of your forgiveness. You are assured of your salvation. And eternity lies ahead, knowing that you will always be in the presence and in the loving care of our Lord Jesus Christ. Could this be you? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Thank you, Lord, for rising from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for defeating sin, defeating death so that we might have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. We celebrate, Lord. We worship. We adore you. We are like the Marys who fall at your feet in worship, recognizing your grace, recognizing your mercy recognizing the fact that we have nothing to offer other than just to fall on our faces before you and worship you. Lord, thank you for lifting us up. Thank you for giving us new life. Thank you for transforming us into your image. Thank you for leading us and guiding us into greater things to be able to be the witnesses in this confusing world, to be the light that you have called us to be so that others might see you, that you would, they would come and see, and they would come and believe and that they would go and tell, and that they would worship you with all they have. We thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Please stand, and we're going to sing uh, Amazing Love. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, why? Because you died and rose again, I'm forgiven again, I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you are condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again, amazing love, how can it be? Died for me. Amazing. 
sing loud, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I forgiven because you are forsaken I'm accepted you are condemned I'm alive and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing life church. What a wonderful message, both in the sermon and in the song we just sang, that Jesus has such amazing love for us that he willingly took our place and died on the cross so that we could be forgiven and accepted for eternity. In response, we seek to honor him in all we do. One way we can honor him is to draw near to him and bring our joys and concerns to him, seeking his guidance through prayer. With that in mind, we bring our prayer concerns and joys before him. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask for healing, peace, and comfort for Lucy Meisner's grandchildren, Chris and Gary, who were involved in a head-on collision this past week when a truck passed another vehicle and crossed over a double yellow line. We also ask for wisdom for the doctors and peace for the whole family as Chris and Gary recover. Catherine Percy has been on hospice since mid-February and is now bedridden. She is getting excellent care at Adderdag and from hospice. Her family is with her. 
We ask for peace and comfort for Catherine and her family as she will soon transition to her heavenly home. We continue to pray for David who has cancer in both kidneys and is too weak for chemo. We ask for peace and comfort for David and Sheila and wisdom for the doctors. We pray for the body of believers to become more active in serving the church and thus one another. We need volunteers to help with the children's and youth ministries and people to serve as elders and deacons. Lord, please stir the hearts of those you are calling to serve. We ask for safe travels for the Hartmans as they leave for a vacation in Europe. We ask for good health and a wonderful visit with their daughter and her family. Bring them back refreshed and relaxed. We thank you, Lord, for Sherry's daughter, Sarah, who has been hired for the job for which she interviewed numerous times. God is good all the time. We also give thanks for the word of the Lord being preached each Sunday. Guide Pastor Glenn as he prepares the message each week. Keep him healthy and give him the stamina and compassion he needs as our shepherd. Continue to bless his marriage to Cindy and give them opportunities to spend quality time together. We give thanks for a successful week of Vacation Bible School this past week. We give praise and glory to the Lord for the wonderful volunteers who helped make the week so special for all the children. Continue to draw these precious little ones to you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Now please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us continue in our time of worship and the giving of our tithes and offerings as the Lord has blessed us so much. Let us give joyfully to the Lord as he leads us this morning. Let us give.
Thanks, gentlemen. Let's stand and sing three verses of Worship Christ the Risen King. Arise, O church, and lift your voices, Christ has come. One more thing before we go. Last week, or this past week, you probably got something in the emails uh, saying what's going on on our campus, and uh, we have some hard copies in the back. If for those that didn't read it or didn't get it, we are having a meeting in the fireside room right after church this afternoon for any of those people that want to have questions or just kind of check out what else is going on. So we'll be in the fireside room if you have any questions about that. If not, grab a, a sheet and read it over and see what great things are happening and how you might get involved. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may his face shine upon you, may his countenance overwhelm you with his mercy and his grace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.